first of all, thank you everyone for being here. And uh, second, uh, thank you to the organizers. And in my case in particular, thank you to Tassos for inviting me to come share this set of ideas. So my goal for today is simply to share a, theory, a theoretical model that is the culmination of several years of work here at Hauenaget, that um, it's finally come together. And so it's, it's, I'm very excited about it and happy to share it today. The basic gist of this model is that I became curious about this problem of displaced aggression, this idea that people act in hostile or aggressive ways towards other people, and there is often no real conscious explanation for it. It makes no sense. These are senseless acts of violence or senseless bullying. And we can look at it at any level of analysis. And the idea is that there's something apparently within us that makes us want to harm other people without any farther instrumental value of the behavior. As a motivational scientist, I have a problem with that. I want to assume from this radical perspective that at some level everything is motivated. The problem is what is it motivated by? And one possibility that's come up that I, I got very excited about was, well, what about this idea that we have these fundamental psychological needs? This is something that's been you know, bouncing around in motivation science and in social psychology in particular for many years. And the issue, of course, is that you know, if the need exists, it's probably unconscious, which means it's going to be very difficult to study. So what this model is, I call it a compensatory competence theory, and I'll explain what I mean by that as I go. But I'm using the word competence very loosely here. So when I say competence, if you're, say, a social psychologist or an educational psychologist, you'll know what I mean by that, the need for competence, self-determination theory, so on and so forth. But if you're interested in organizational behavior or these other dom domains, you might think control motivation. Or if you're a cognitive scientist, you might think agency. These all share this underlying principle of people want to have effective interactions with their environment. And that's the basic principle behind why I think people engage in displaced aggression. Now, the background of this research, you can go, you go about as far back as the 1930s when John Dollard and colleagues came up with the original frustration aggression hypothesis. And what's interesting is that if, if you go back to the original readings, when they, when they spoke about uh, Frustration, you know, we know this idea that when frustration increases, somehow this links to aggression. But actually back then, when they were talking about it, they really meant frustrated goals, as in blocked goals, thwarted goals. They, they didn't have the language of affect that we might use today. And so it really was this concept of blocked goals increasing aggression. It wasn't until decades of research, and then somewhere in the 1980s, when uh, Leonard Berkowitz and several colleagues came up with the idea that well, maybe these displaced aggression effects uh, are all kind of bound by the idea to the extent that aversive events increase negative affect. And this is where we are theoretically today, this idea that somehow aggression is somehow explained by the presence of negative affect or an aversive reaction. And so this led into this, just we have this an explosion of ideas now about, you know, is it, is it cognitive activation at a low level such that negative affect primes hostile scripts and memory, which primes aggressive goals, and that's why consciously we only know we want to hurt someone, but it's all coming from the bottom up from a cognitive perspective. Well, and much like uh, uh, Peter de Jong mentioned, is that it's just escalated. The number of potential mechanisms to explain what's going on in the displaced aggression world has just exploded over the last 20 years, and there's this question of, can we organize this somehow? And so one of the goals of my research was to say, what if, what if all this were true? But we just got back to this for just for a minute. What if not only do we have aggression, displaced aggression com coming from the bottom up, but can it also happen what we call from the top down, that there's a goal, of a, a, a need that is being somehow served by harming a random person who doesn't deserve it? In other words, good or bad, hurting someone, you're achieving an effect in your environment. It's some sort of feedback. So the basis of the logic for this model is rooted in these uh, socio-cognitive models of goal pursuit. And the idea is that if you can imagine an associative network in memory, goals can be organized in terms of hierarchy, that we have these fundamental needs or goals, things like competence, autonomy, belonging, you know, we can come up with an infinite number of fundamental needs we might have. And these are served by these lower order sub-goals acting as means to this higher order goal. And the basic gist here is that if, with this model, we're, what the, the idea is that we might be consciously paying attention to everyday goal pursuits. You know, we, we get up, we go to work, we try to publish papers, we try to do this, that, and the other. But the idea is that these are all serving as feedback to this chronic need, whatever it might be, that I'm calling competence. Now, if I apply that architecture to 
try to understand displaced aggression, what I would be arguing is that we have this need for competence that's regularly served by our achievement pursuits or our goal pursuits of various kinds, but sometimes those goals are going to be blocked. Sometimes we cannot pursue those goals. And then what do we do? The need is still there and it's still activated. If anything, at this point, it's threatened. What I'm arguing is that there's a substitution that happens. We then switch over to use aggression as a new means to interact with our environment to get some sort of competence-related feedback. So we're purely in this world of experiencing efficacy, okay? Experiencing effects in our environment. Now, with this theoretical model, the idea is that we can make a number of predictions, and I'm not going to go through the uh, details of the experiments themselves, but I'll, I'll kind of give you a bird's eye view that the predictions get quite interesting. So one is this first idea that we need to really separate the notion that displaced aggression is always purely about some sort of bottom-up negative arousal or negative activation. And so what I did here was I ran a study where uh, participants would experience some sort of uh, academic or intellectual failure task. We can manipulate whether it's success or failure, and many studies have looked at this in the past and whether or not this increases displaced aggression. When I'm in, in this case, displaced aggression can be anything from trying to physically harm someone with noise blasts to trying to sabotage later participants by giving them harder problems, all kinds of different DVs. But what I sought to do was I sought to manipulate first whether or not a goal had been activated. So in this case, I would prime an achievement goal or not via an experimental task, and then separately manipulate whether they experienced success or failure on an academic task. And the point is, this two-by-two -two design lets you really tease apart the aversive experience from the presence or absence of a motivation. And the results of this uh, uh, particular study was it was pretty clear, the only in the condition where a goal had been activated, so we'd primed achievement-related concepts, so winning, striving, so on and so forth, and they experienced failure, that's when we see this spike in displaced aggression, and in this particular case, sending harder problems to some ostensible other participant. What's also interesting here is I did measure affect. Of course I measured affect. But the motivation had no impact on it. We got this main effect of the failure experience. It increased hostile affect, so anger, irritation, incre increased anxious affect, uh, anxiety, feeling tense. But this was totally unrelated to the interaction effect. This notion of a thwarted goal, experiencing both goal activation and failure, increasing displaced aggression. So this says that there might be some kind of difference. In fact, in, in this particular study, the displaced aggression wasn't even correlated with negative affect. The only thing that was correlated was an explicit reported intention to harm the other person. Now, where this gets especially interesting is that same two-by-two -two experimental design where you're manipulating the goal activation and failure in another study also was shown to reduce their self-efficacy beliefs, so their beliefs about their ability to produce certain outcomes in the environment. Uh, so this suggested to me that the same conditions that increase displaced aggression are also in, uh, 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 threatening one's sense of competence. And so one, the next question that came along in this, well, is there something about getting to act aggressively that is somehow has some sort of compensatory or restorative component to it? So I uh, ran a new set of studies where uh, participants, uh, they received kind of this goal-thwarting manipulation, similar to what I had just talked about, but in this case, we then manipulated whether or not they even had an opportunity to be clearly aggressive or not. So in this case, I don't know if you're familiar with it. Social psychology is very clever with this kind of stuff. They have a, a hot sauce paradigm. And you've probably all heard about it. But if you haven't, it's, it, the gist of it is that um, you can measure aggression towards another person by the extent to which uh, you are willing to give them uh, a, a more hot sauce knowing that they don't like spicy foods because you know this is going to hurt them. And so the DV is typically how much hot sauce you give them. That's a measure of displaced aggression because you don't know the other person. There's no reason to do it. But what I did was I manipulated whether they were dishing out hot sauce, which was clearly aggressive, or some other kind of sauce, like an American-style southern barbecue sauce, which, I mean, in large amounts it can get nasty, I guess, but it's not really clearly aggressive. And the point was, was that only in the condition where participants were goal-thwarted and only when they got to be clearly aggressive, so this hot sauce condition, did we see this uh, attenuation of the loss of self-efficacy as a result of the failure. So in other words, something about getting to act aggressively either restored or somehow buffered the loss of self-efficacy that was subsequently uh, would ordinarily occur. Now, the big question that comes out of this research um, is, is a superordinate goal, is that ultimate goal truly something about competence? Because if it is, and the whole reason we might want to do this kind of research is because 
if it, we can get at that underlying motivation, we can redirect it or we can attenuate it through other means, through other mechanisms. And for the last couple of years, and especially in collaboration with people uh, here, we've gotten much more deep, uh, deeper into this particular question. How do we redirect the response to show that it is, in fact, linked to some subordinate competence need? So in one particular study, we find that um, this is a lab study done here with the uh, Hanukkah students, where we manipulate, after the goal thwarting manipulation, we manipulated whether or not taking action uh, in, a, in an experimental setting uh, towards some ostensible other participant represented either harming them. In other words, if, if you hit that space bar, it'll stop them from getting to enter a 35-year-old lottery. But if you just sit back and relax, they'll get to do it. I didn't use the word relax, but then the other condition is kind of the reverse. You hit the space bar and it'll help them, but if you sit back, they'll automatically be blocked. And so what we were manipulating here was whether or not taking action versus inaction represented aggression versus helping. Okay, and the point here was, was I didn't see a difference. Participants wanted to hit the space bar. They wanted to take some kind of action, and it didn't matter if it was helping or hurting. So for me, this was an initial sign that this was about, after I have a goal blocked, I want to interact with my environment. I want to do something, good or bad, doesn't matter. In another uh, study that uh, we conducted online, it was, all I did here was we did this goal thwarting manipulation and then simply manipulated whether they thought they would have a second opportunity to do the original test again. And just that belief was enough to attenuate displaced aggression. In this case, they were less likely to want to sabotage uh, uh, some random other person's uh, chances to win money. Now, other research. Well, for example, I found that uh, uh, interesting study with uh, some of the social psychology folks around here is that we uh, manipulated whether or not um, they thought that their in-group would endorse a certain kind of aggressive action or not. In this case, it was Americans' uh, uh, endorsement of military intervention in Syria. So this was late December last year. And essentially, if they thought that their in-group was thought that this was a good idea, a competent idea, these kinds of things, it would be efficacious, they were more likely to support war after, only after a goal-thwarting manipulation. But if they, thought, if, we, if they read kind of the exact same information, but some other group believed that, well, they weren't supportive of it. In fact, they were kind of opposed to it. So we're seeing this like support versus opposition to war just hinging on whether or not they think this is what competence means. And uh, very recently, in uh, another study, we looked at uh, American gun owners last year in this really extraordinary and terrifying study that just overlapped with the Orlando mass shooting. And we were doing this thing where we were trying to manipulate success and failure with these kind of priming manipulations. And what we found was that American gun owners, after this kind of failure type experience, they reported this increased justification for using gun violence against some random home intruder, right? And it wasn't clear whether they would be armed. And uh, especially if they already felt highly threatened in other ways. But what was so interesting was that that effect, that displaced aggressive tendency, was mediated by the extent to which this increase in beliefs that their guns are, in fact, means of personal empowerment. And empowerment is just another way of talking about efficacy. So again, so efficacy and competence-related factors are they're not only moderating, but in this particular study, mediating this tendency towards displaced aggression. So thinking more broadly, if this theory has legs, what it really does is it kind of feeds into this idea that self-destructive behavior, destructive, socially destructive behavior in general, is actually potentially quite purposive. It's not random. It's not senseless. We might hate it. We might not like it as a society, but it has an underlying purpose. And this focus on psychological needs gets interesting because, one, it lends a lot more empathy to potential aggressors, but two, it gives us a, a, a kind of a focal point to think about if we really want to talk about interventions. It's capturing that moment before someone becomes a hero or a villain in being able to steer that somehow. And for me personally, as someone who's interested in implicit processes, implicit motivation, priming, these kinds of things, I mean, this is the gist here is that maybe there is room for that kind of research in trying to understand these really mysterious social behaviors that conscious processes simply cannot yet explain. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much.